Hi, this is Max Brooks, author of World War Z and Devolution, and for some reason, you are listening to the Booked Podcast. Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. This is episode 501. I just want to, like, take... I, I feel like we deserve... We earned it. Like, we can, like, kind of stretch, like, flex a little bit on that 500 plus. Uh, for uh, sure, Ben. Uh, this is the beginning of our second 500 episodes. <laughs> uh, or the second half of our first thousand. All, all shit that most people can't say, so... Correct. That's very, very true. Uh, this episode is going to be a review of... The Max Booth the Third book, Touch the Night, which is out from Cemetery Dance this coming Tuesday at the time we're recording this. Here's a little bit about Max. He's the editor-in-chief of Perpetual Motion Machine, the managing editor of Dark Moon Digest, and the host of two podcasts, Ghoulish and Castle Rock Radio. He's the author of many novels and frequently contributes articles to Lit Reactor, Crime Reads, the San Antonio Current, Fangoria, and Film 14. He lives in Texas. All right, here is the synopsis for Touch the Night. Mother, mother, rise from the ground. Pretend that was in some kind of chanting form. It's probably <laughs> more the way it was meant to be delivered. Stranger Things and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre unite to form a blood-soaked matrimony of violence and corruption. Something sinister is hiding in the small town of Percy, Indiana, and 12-year-old Joshua Washington and Alonzo Jones are about to find themselves up close and personal with it. After a harmless night of petty property damage leads to the unthinkable, the red and blue lights of a cop car are the last things these boys want to see, especially a cop car driven by something not quite human. Enter Mary Washington and, o and Otessa Jones. Their sons have been best friends for years, and now Josh and Alonzo have been abducted in the dead of night. Worst of all, the local sheriff refuses to believe they're missing, leaving it up to, up to Mary and Otessa to take the law into their own hands before a family of ungodly lunatics can complete a ritual decades in the making. Together, they will embark on a surreal and violent journey into a land of corrupt law enforcement, small town secrets, gravitational oddities, and ancient black magic. Yeah, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the the synopsis. I think does a is, does a pretty good job. But um, did you read it before you started reading the book? Like, were you aware what we were getting into? Um, yes, actually, I yeah, I, this time I was. <laughs> uh, I did too, and that was actually one of the things that I was like, um, well, let's let this should be freaking interesting, um, and. I want to call back to when we had Richard Chismar on the podcast because uh, he's the one that published this book. And when we asked him, you know, what voices are excited about, one of the things he said was Max Booth. And uh, he compared Max to Richard Lehman. And this is something that, you know, through messages between me and Lovius came up as we were reading this book because there was, you know, there was a point where I got so far into the book and I texted Livius and I was like, Dude, I see. I see what he was saying. And Livius, you you've read way more layman than me, um, so you probably know better how good of a comparison that is. Um, yeah, I uh, I was gonna talk more about this during my wrap up, but we can we can do it now. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I I think I'm not sure how to put this real succinctly, and maybe by the end of the podcast, I'll have a better way of saying this. But I think whatever weird dark shit inspired Laban to write the way he does I feel like maybe a booth is also inspired by the same thing and, and honestly the the reason that I brought that up is anybody who's um listened to the two layman reviews that we've done on the podcast at the very least or read read him on their own would know that there's a certain level of uh gore and violence and kind of insanity that comes along with those stories. That's why I wanted to bring it up at the beginning of the episode, because I want to say there is a lot of really freaky stuff that happens in this book. That is probably not for everybody um, because of how kind of extreme it gets. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I'm not, I didn't realize that's why we were going there, but yes, I <laughs> also have to agree that this book is, um, very graphic and foul and disgusting in in all the ways like this type of horror should be. 
right yeah perfect for what it's yeah. trying to do but for sure yeah not everybody's gonna be able to follow the whole thing so i guess we can talk about the story i just thought that, I, that was my long-winded way up front of saying like <laughs> there's some crazy shit that happens in this book yes indeed and i'm sure we'll get into some of it and try not to be spoilery about it so <laughs> Our book opens on our um, our two real protagonists, I think, at the heart of this. And we'll talk about there's really kind of two sets of protagonists um, in this book. But it's um, it's Alonzo and uh, and Joshua. They are uh, having a little bit of a sleepover. And uh, they decide, like kids who are 12 years old, that uh, they're going to sneak out of the house and, and go around, uh, you know, get, get outside for a little bit and, and, and pretty much cause some trouble um, around town. But, you know, it starts out, you know, with what they feel at 12 years old is fairly innocent um, trouble. But as the synopsis says, it it pretty quickly turns into something um, much more dangerous. Yeah. uh, Like Livia said, little little antics uh, to start off the night, um, like messing around in people's yards and stuff. But they decide they're going to go to a local gas station. And the big the big scary thing about that in the beginning is they're both 12 and they're out after curfew. So they're they're being kind of rebellious and and badasses by just walking into a gas station um after curfew so like they go in and obviously like the goal is just they're going to get some snacks and stuff and um you know kind of continue whatever random kid stuff they're doing that night but when they get to the front counter it comes out in the transaction that uh they don't have any money to pay for like the snacks that they want and so Alonzo decides that he's going to try to barter. That's, and That's probably where we should leave that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know how far we wanted to go with that. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I would leave that there. I think that uh, some of the story needs to be discovered on its own, and that's probably one of those parts. Sorry to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... So yeah, he decides he, he is going to try to barter. The bartering goes poorly. Um, and, and a uh, scuffle ensues um, in which the um, person working at the convenience store slash gas station is, is is pretty seriously injured. Yeah, and that causes uh, our two protagonists to go on the run. Now, <clears throat> a couple things I want to say about these kids. Um, first of all, we should mention because it's mentioned in the book, if not in the synopsis, that they are black. And apparently the town of Percy, Indiana, in the early 2000s, may have been um, fairly racist. So this does come up um, at this point when you had, Rob had said that <clears throat> them being out after dark and stuff, there, there's a lot of things about them being black that play into that as well. So that's something we should mention. Um, the other thing is, I don't know how harmless these kids are. They are out, like, destroying property and doing <laughs> some, some, like, there's a part where they talk about where they were, like, at the highway overpass, like, throwing rocks at cars. Not this particular night, but, like, in a previous instance. So I don't want to make it sound like they're, you know, oh, they're just some innocent kids. Like, you know, they're making too much noise late at night. Like, they're kind of little assholes. And a lot of that is uh, is driven by, uh, by Alonzo, who's really the troublemaker in my opinion, and I think you probably see it the same way. And then uh, Josh is his buddy, who's a little bit more of a of a follower than a leader. Totally agree uh, on the point that the kids are not innocent, but I wonder to what degree is that like every kid? Like, I'll admit that I was involved in some fucked up shit like as a teenager, especially like the younger, you know, like you're younger, you're naive, you don't really understand the, like the not the consequences of your actions, but like the impact of what you do having on other people. Um, Dude, I'm not, <laughs> I am not, I am not buying for a second that you were, that you were some kind of troublemaker at 13. <laughs> I just want you to know that. I don't know. I don't, I don't really, whatever we can debate that whole other thing. I just want to call you out on that and say, I, I kind of doubt, I, I don't believe it. So, I mean, yeah, but the, I mean, so one of the things, so for me, and I'm not saying like I was standing at an overpass throwing rocks at cars. Um, but I was, I got up to shenanigans. And one of the reasons was when I was 13, um, I was a freshman in high school and everybody that I hung out with was seniors. So I was doing senior shenanigans seen, you know, at the age of, of 13. Um, so it was there. You had to be somewhat of a troublemaker yourself. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't arguing saying I wasn't, I was just (laughs) saying, I don't believe you were. (laughs) 
So that that, that, was, that was a commentary on myself. It's funny that you say that too, though, because you know what? When I was a when I was a freshman in high school, I hung out with a lot of like juniors and seniors. Hmm. And it's interesting that that we both had that uh, that in common. That is interesting. I, now, before we move past this, uh, the whole behavior thing, I just want to plug that later on, probably in spoiler talk, because what I want to say may reveal more about the story than um, we really should. Um, I, ha- I have an idea about people and how they their behavior is going on in this book. So let's so we're going to talk about that. In spoiler talk. Probably. I just want to say that I'm a middle aged man. Those fucking kids better stay off my lawn. That's where I'm at with those antics <laughs> and shenanigans. That's... I'm too poor to have a lawn, so I don't have to worry oh, about well, that. That's, that's fair. All right. So. All right. Before we move on, I, this is one of those things where I just something you say reminds me of something that has absolutely nothing to do with the podcast. But um, so I lived in Chicago for years and years. And as a car owner in Chicago, like nothing bad ever happened to my car at all, except for like, you know, the city giving me tickets, but that's just what the city does. I moved out to the the town I live in now four and a half years ago. And I don't live in like a fancy rich town, but I'm like rich adjacent enough where you figure it's a nice town everything's gonna be cool uh within three months of moving out here my car got keyed three separate times dude that's uh that's crazy so i remember i remember your car having key marks on it i don't (laughs) think we ever talked about it though yeah yeah like like I, i figured like you could ask somebody but it's there's never a good story i'm assuming yeah, based on you saying that that you'd have no knowledge of what who right like what no it's it's a little i knew it's little assholes from around town or whatever just could have been these two kids i mean could have been I guess Al- they'd, josh and Alonzo. I guess they'd, yeah i guess they'd be like full-on adults now but yeah um yeah that sucks i i don't know how to look people are assholes everywhere i guess is how you explain that right like you can be in a you can't in escape a, yeah assholes Correct. You got to move out. You got to move out to. Um, oh, this would be a part where, if I remember the name, Green Greenwood. What was that called? Green Loop. Green Green Loop. Green Loop. I thought you were going to say Percy, to Indiana. I was going to be like previous mm-hmm. previous episode. Um, yeah. So, any rate, uh, kids uh, sometimes make trouble. I guess is what <laughs> all of that all of that came down to. So. <laughs> These particular kids, though, so they they and, and I know it sounds like we're going way into the story. Trust me, we're not getting anywhere near like the meat of the story. Um, so they, you know, they, they, they run away from from the trouble, as uh, I would likely do in their situation. And it, it doesn't take too long for um, for the cops to find them. Only these cops are not, um, they're not your typical cops. Yeah, so I'd say that any kids out after curfew who, you know, even if you even if you don't think the law knows what you've been up to, like you still have that kind of projection of like, they know what I did. So like any kid in their situation would be, like that's the last thing they want is to get stopped by the cops. Um, but even more so like to the point where, you know, like inter interaction with the law in in that town and you know in that time being a, a black kid uh was just like even more scary and and like Livia said the cops the cops it's obvious uh pretty early on in the interaction that um they're not necessarily the types of cops you'd want to run into and to be fair Alonzo is very uh antagonistic toward the police and Josh is really just kind of terrified um, but the cops are definitely like not like your friendly police officers. <laughs> so from the synopsis, so this is where I cover our asses, right? <laughs> a cop car driven by something not quite human. Bingo. And, uh, you know, something kind of interesting, I think, happens in, in that scene. And without, you know, really digging into it. I, you know, it doesn't strike me that that um, Josh and Alonzo have had like a lot of run ins with the police. And, you know, they, they might think something is off. But I, I think to us, the reader looking in on the story, we all know something is off. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't think anybody would read that part and be like, like oh, what's going to happen with these cops? You're like, what the fuck is going on? Like, this isn't right. That's really kind of the feeling that I think was conveyed. So even though they are. Um, naive by by way of their age, um, you know, and, and not really sure what to expect. It does seem pretty off to us as the reader right away that this is not a legit, 
this is not a couple of legit cops, um, you know, whatever, wrestling on some kids up for whatever they may or may not have done. <laughs> yeah, kind of like you're uh, watching a horror movie and you're like, he's right behind you, he's right behind you. But like, yep. you know, you can't say, you know, the, the character's not going to hear you. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. So I'm going to flip over to the other group of protagonists, the co-protagonists, maybe. I don't know if that's right. So um, we'll start with the first one we're introduced to, sort of off screen introduced to, which is Otessa. She is Alonzo's mom. Um, and boy, is she something. So our introduction is through the, uh, I was going to say through the eyes, but through the ears of um, Josh, who's staying over at, at Alonzo, i.e., you know, Otessa's house, um, as he's listening through the walls to her have sex with somebody who we know or, or will know, you know, is like a, a, a one night stand. Um, and, and this is not a, a, this is not a, a rare occurrence for her. So um, not not going to win any mom of the year awards, um, Otessa. Um, she's single mom raising um, Alonzo. But, yeah, she's still a little bit of a drinking problem, maybe a little bit of a whoring problem, you know, that, that type of thing. <laughs> um, and uh, Mary, who is the the other um, protagonist on that team, who is Josh's mom? She's she's a little more proper. Um, she's. Uh, you know, doesn't seem to drink a lot, um, is, is, you know, in a uh, monogamous relationship with, with her husband of 13 or 14 years, whatever it is. So um, ultimately, uh, their kids go missing, and the two of them, uh, through a pretty windy road, wind up teaming up, um, you know, to save them. Which, again, I think we just spent like 15 minutes explaining the synopsis, um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit better of an idea of how we get into the meat of the story. The Otessa part where she's got the one night stand. That's what, that's one of the reasons the kids decide to sneak out and go on their little uh, uh, adventure. So that's, that's the timeline for that. And then when everybody wakes up in the morning, they're like, Hey, where the hell's like, obviously Otessa is the first to notice that the kids aren't, you know, in her house. Uh, And then she kind of raises the alarm for, Hey Mary, did the kids come over or like whatever, that kind of thing, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, it's not too long uh, from when, like, the next morning that they decide to go to the police. All right. To make a, a, a long story a little shorter, uh, they present to the cops, um, tell them that they, uh, at first, you know, they show up saying, hey, you've, you've got our kids. Um, you know, we saw you pick them up. Otessa saw a cop car, um, you know, talk about the kids and the kids getting in the car and stuff. And the police are like, yeah, we don't know what you're talking about. So uh, a little bit of that, and that kind of puts them on their own path to looking for their children. I don't know how much else we're going to talk about, but this uh, story takes place in, in the back and forth. So we see um, Mary and Otessa and, you know, everybody, it's not the kids, some scenes with them. Then what's going on with the kids and what's going on with the kids is absolutely fucking horrifying. Um, I don't know how deep we want to go into this. I want to stick to kind of the rules of the synopsis. And in there it says, a family of ungodly lunatics can complete a ritual decades in the making. So I think from a story standpoint, we'll we'll kind of leave it there. And then maybe we could talk about some of the elements, unless there's something you want to add from a, from a story standpoint, Rob. Yeah. So uh, we're being very careful with what we're saying about this story, even like with revealing some of the stuff that happens early on, because um, I think we want to leave the freaky part of it intact as much as possible. So it seems like we're dancing around stuff. There's absolutely a reason for it. Um, It's because the story unfolds in a way that I think it's best if you learn things without having already known them. Um, So I believe that's why me and Livius are dancing a little bit more than usual. Uh, What I will say is that um, we have touched on absolutely just the most mundane aspects of the story. And um, there is a side of the story that is really, really crazy. Um, And and I'll touch on what I like, I guess, in in wrap-ups. But, like, he does a really good job of mixing two kind of different stories into one because realistically like Livia said you got a couple of parents that are looking for their missing kids and then you on the other side of it you have an absolute horror movie going on and we're switching back and forth between the two and it's like how are these going to resolve so it was an interesting format and like looking at two 
two things that are so different um, working toward each other, toward a resolution, was uh, a really interesting way to write the book. Yeah, I think I think we can both <laughs> both agree on that. Um, there's a lot of supernatural stuff in this book, and that's we were talking earlier about Layman, and I'm not I'm not trying to make comparisons, but since it came up, like I feel there there are a few things I want to I want to address. Um, there's a very, very heavy supernatural element in this book, and again, it's it's clearly um, mentioned in the synopsis. So I don't feel like I'm giving anything away. Um, that's one thing that Layman didn't do very much of. Um, but there are other things here that 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 really, you know, r- remind me of, of layman's storytelling style. You know, there's a lot of crazies. There's multiple crazies. So it's not it's not just one. There there are a bunch of people and people's reactions um, to things. This is one of the things that that both um, sometimes drove me crazy. Um, but sometimes um, endeared me to, to layman. And, and it happened a little bit here. Um, Otessa who um, is, you know, foul-mouthed, abrasive, um, pretty much willing to uh, get into a fight with anybody she encounters in this book, like physical altercations are always like at the top of her mind, Mm -hmm. Um, is one of those characters who I don't know, how do I say this? You either love it or you hate it, and it's all based on the character. So this is one of the things that would happen in layman books, and I'm going to say it about a layman book, and then you kind of take this to Otessa. Like, there is something really serious and horrifying going on, but there's that character that always takes time to, like, crack a joke, Mm -hmm. and it feels out of place because you're thinking to yourself, if I was in this situation, I'd be too busy shitting myself to, like, make a funny about somebody's dog, for example. Um, you know, so it, depending on how you like that, I mean, one thing she, she definitely serves is, is to bring a little bit of comedic levity to the story. Sure. Um, but there is that same, that same kind of, I'm not sure her reactions always fit. And again, I I think for the most part in in this story, she, she's oddly the, the, the only levity there, there's, there's a couple of side characters that pop up that are actually kind of you know, chuckle out loud, <laughs> um, you know, funny. Um, but really she's cause, cause Mary's taking this very seriously. And, and I don't know that she steps too far out of the bounds of what I think a mother whose child is missing. Like I have any idea what that would be like. Right. Um, but yeah, so there is that there's, there's kind of not only do you have multiple crazies, but you have characters who don't always react in the, in the, you know, most reasonable way to that kind of situation. We I mean, can talk about Mary's husband. I know we, we barely mentioned him, right? I don't even know if we mentioned him. Um, Jasper. Yeah. He's a, he's another interesting character, but I think we're going to talk a lot of, more about that in spoiler talk. So maybe we'll leave that for, for there. Yeah. So I think it's as good a time as any, probably to jump over into spoiler talk. Um, this is definitely one that we're going to go into a lot of like the real meat of the story that we can't talk about. Uh, without spoiling things. So um, if you have read the book or don't care about spoilers, patreon.com slash booked uh, $2 or more a month gets you uh, access to all of our spoiler talk. And uh, yeah, this one's going to be a, a, a doozy. I think at least in the, in as much as we're going to talk about some really messed up stuff. All right. We're back from spoiler talk. Absolutely helped me figure out how I feel about this book. Um, as far as like some of the stuff that was a little less obvious, um, I love doing spoiler talk. I'm happy that we could do it for this one. Um, and as we kind of talked about at the end of spoiler talk, looking forward to picking the brain of the author to kind of get some answers out of him as well. For sure. Um, anything else you want to do before we wrap stuff up? I'm ready to wrap. Uh, all right. Um, would you like to go first then? Yeah. So this is my first Max Booth book. Um, he's been obviously on my radar for all of the v- various things he does as a publisher, uh, as a fellow podcaster, um, and even hearing him talk on like, this is horror. I've, I've heard some interviews he did over there. So, uh, definitely aware of him. And I was definitely excited to get a hold of this book, especially after some of the accolades that came before it, which was obviously, um, when we had Richard Chismar on, the publisher, he was raving about the book. But then also recently when we talked to Josh Mallerman, 
he was raving about the book to the point where in our conversation, he said, after you read it, you're going to message me and say, you were right. So, um, I, I have to go back and send that message, but, uh, uh, the hype didn't disappoint. This is definitely one of those books where, um, it's it, like Livius has said, it's probably a good thing that we changed audience to conclusion because, um, I don't think that this book would hit right with a large audience, but the type of people that appreciate this type of writing would really appreciate this. Uh, there was, I would say that some of our traditional categories of rating, uh, with this particular type of story suffer a little bit. Uh, I, I really feel like the story hinges on the tone and the feeling that it sets. So I think one of the things that he put a lot of energy into is setting this creepy, supernatural, tense kind of tone. Um, especially in the way that he did it kind of bifurcated between what was going on with the moms and what was going on with the kids. Um, so a very tone heavy book, which means it didn't have to rely as much on some of the other stuff that, you know, books might rely on, which like, so language and narrative, I didn't really score too high because it didn't lean on those types of things to make the story effective. Um, I feel like it was very tone heavy. Uh, I feel like the conclusion was a big part of it. And it's the type of story where even up to close to the end, you're asking yourself, how the hell is this going to wrap up? So um, is he going to stick the landing or not? And I feel like he he absolutely did. So, yeah, those are really kind of the standout things for me. I think pace was good when you're basically telling two parallel stories. Um, that's a, That's a benefit as well, as long as you're kind of moving forward in each of them like at a good pace and he managed that. So, uh, I mean, those are the big points for me overall. I really like this book and, uh, scores out to about to an eight out of 10. I'm not going to go through my list of scores cause they're all within like one point of Rob's. And so I, I by and large agree with, with pretty much everything he, he said in his wrap up. So I'm going to go a little bit, uh, a, there's a couple I want to focus on, um, um, con- conclusion. I know Rob touched on it, but this could have gone a very, very different way. And and I, I, I think Rob probably was thinking the same thing I was, that it was going to go in a different direction, um, you know, maybe say at the 80 percent mark. Right. Um, and, and again, I don't know that the other direction would have been bad, but I think that he really stuck the landing on this one, um, which in, in a lot of cases in, in, you know, what I'll call big horror stories. And I, I think this fits that category. And sometimes you have to let the end go a little bit, you know, like it's not, not everybody sticks to landing. And I think that that's something that Booth did, um, did really well here. Um, I really liked the, the supernatural element of the story. Um, there was a lot of different things packed in here, but it didn't feel like it was just being, um, piled on. I, I think that each, different aspect of the supernatural story was done um very well and very creepy i mean horror books don't creep me out and i don't know if ultimately i'm gonna say that that this one did but if one had the potential to uh, of the i don't know whatever say the last 15 or 20 books that we read this one this one definitely is is up there um due to the nature the things I'm talking about, I can't say what it is. I mentioned over in spoiler talk, but there's some really unsettling shit towards the end of this book that Rob and I talked about. And, and I'm very appreciative of that. I think uh, Mallerman and Chismar, right. This is my first booth um, book. Uh, so I, I don't have any other exposure, but yeah, there's, there's definitely something in here. There, there's a, there's a crowd that is going to be very excited uh, about this. I, I belong to a Richard Lehman fan club group on Facebook. Um, that crowd, I think, if if they read this book, would be very excited at a uh, at a younger voice um, and this type of storytelling. I, I mean, I don't know that this doesn't fit like the same like fans of Bentley Little. Um, and I know we only read the bank; that's our only exposure. But I think Rob would agree with me. The Bentley Little fans would like this. Richard Lehman fans would like this. So uh, overall, my score wasn't very far from Rob's. Mine came out to a seven point eight eight after averaging the eight. Um, different scores, so uh, that brings the total to a seven point nine three seven five. 
um, which I'm sure that Max is going to want to run right out and put on like the paperback edition, right? That's 7.9, 3.75 out of 10. But yeah, I, it's really, really enjoyable story. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention in my uh, uh, wrap up that I did talk about in spoiler talk is, uh, and this is the vaguest I'm going to be because uh, uh, for spoilers, obviously, is that I think he gave an incredible character arc for the mothers in this book. Um, from where they started to where they ended, um, just really, really good storytelling. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to forget to say that to our non-spoiler talk uh, listeners. One a couple other things about uh, this, uh, and we'll move on to some other um, things. But uh, we will be interviewing uh, Max Booth the third um, two days from now. When we're recording this, so check back later this week for our interview with him, where we're going to press him on things like. What town exactly is Percy, Indiana based on <laughs> um, and other, you know, really deep digging questions like, like that. Um, but we're also going to be deciding um, that night on how we're giving away these two signed advanced review copies that are not available for sale. And they are signed by Max Booth the third. So tune into that to figure out how you can uh, how you can win those. What I will tell you is. Check frequently, because the way my co-host wanted to give these away, you'll have to be really, really quick on the draw. So you'll want to listen. If you're interested, I don't know how we're doing it. But if Rob had his way, yeah. They'd be gone already. <laughs> they, 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 yeah, they'd essentially be gone by the time you heard this. So um, um, uh, so to that point, I want to, as far as like availability of the book, um, uh, I just want to clarify for the world that's listening, the millions of viewer, listeners we have. So this was... Uh, originally acquired as a limited hardcover release from cemetery dance. And, um, so the advanced review copies that Livius just mentioned are trade paperback, um, arcs from cemetery dance. Max also is releasing a paperback and Kindle version of the book, um, as well on the 16th of June. So should be the day that this episode releases, Professional Motion Machine Publishing is releasing the paperback that is not limited, and then also Kindle. So um, we have fulfilled our goal of always reading books that anybody can acquire. But all of that is to say we are probably – the arcs we're giving out are probably super limited as well because they're the only paperbacks that came out from Cemetery Dance uh, signed by Max. So a little collector's, little collector's item. There you go. We'll have to discuss um, weird licensing publishing stuff. Like, I, I guess I never <laughs> thought about that kind of stuff happening in in um, literature, right? Like, that's the weird kind of shit that right. you hear when when people ask questions like, "Why isn't Wolverine in the Avengers movies?" <laughs> and then someone's like, "Well, you have to understand, Sony owns Wolverine, but only in the yellow costume." And then this other person, like, you know what I mean? Right. It winds up being this kind of weird thing. So, anyway, looking forward to talking with max about this book and um you know i mean he only does about 30 other things so i don't think we're going to run out of topics yeah another thing we're probably going to talk about which just released um recently was a novella of his called we need to do something that has to do with a family in a in a tornado kind of uh, uh emergency so hopefully i'll have time to to read that between now and when we talk to max in a couple of days all right uh, uh, I want to touch on a bit of sad news um, over the last few days. Um, so I think it was on Saturday, maybe it was Friday. Um, uh, T.W. Brown, Todd Brown, um, passed away. So if that name sounds vaguely familiar to you, it could be um, he appeared on this podcast probably eight years ago. And uh, he was one of the contributors to the book anthology. His story faces on the milk carton. Um, which with my terrible memory, there's, there's probably a handful of stories that someone give me the name to, and I could remember all the details, but that's, that's one of them. So, uh, Todd Brown had passed away, um, from a heart attack seemingly. Um, and he's survived by his wife, Denise, who's a very nice lady. And then quite honestly helped us with the book anthology, as far as all the ISBN number and all that weird, the, all the hard work, right. That, that needs to be done. So our, uh, our sympathies are, are with her and, uh, rest in peace, Todd Brown. Yeah, I was lucky enough when I was in um, Portland after the Seattle AWP, so I want to say that was 2014 maybe, to spend uh, a night hanging out with Todd and Denise. And 
if you want to talk about like you're you're a visitor from town or from out of town and you want to see friends you've got the kind of friends that are like yeah come over to my house and it's like man i'm I'm in the hotel i'm downtown it's such it's fucking annoying then you got the friends that are like let me come to you i'll pick you up we'll take you to these awesome places and that's what they were the most hospitable most friendly most generous people um and it was a wonderful time and uh yeah so i'm happy that i got to have that um obviously never thought that this would happen but um yeah i just such great people yeah we're uh we're very saddened uh by this so um i don't have any other information yeah. i don't know like more like i but, but i don't know what good it is right it's the internet age go hit denise brown up on our facebook page uh, in case you hadn't heard and, and offer your condolences there so all right, we know Max Booth is coming up next, but then we have two whole episodes we're not 100% sure what we're going to do with. So there could be a book. There's likely going to be one interview. And, you know, God willing, there will be two interviews, but uh, we'll see. So the next couple of weeks, uh, a little sketchy on what's going to happen, but uh, for sure, like 72 hours from when you're hearing this, check back for Max Booth the third, the interview. And uh, until then, I'm Livia Studden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading.